introduction. I want to wa welcome uh, Dr. Fay Dye today. He's a candidate for our Astro Materials and Solar System Formation position. Fay is currently at Caltech, where he is the Geological and Planetary Sciences Chair's postdoctoral fellow, where he has been since 2019. Uh, Dr. Dye got his PhD in physics from MIT in 2019, where he got to do a stint of that period at uh, Princeton University. And he got his BA in natural sciences and masters of science in physics from the University of Cambridge from the Institute of Astronomy there. Uh, Dr. Faye's niche is designing novel observational tests to understand the most bizarre exoplanets where bizarre exoplanets includes things like ultra short period planets, planets with tilted orbits or high stellar obliquities, inflated planets called super puffs. I hope he talks about those today yeah. and planets undergoing very rapid mass loss. This research isn't just into the eclectic and unusual, but really it's a strategy to study planetary systems where physical process that also shape our regular, more normal planets, uh, where they exhibit things like atmospheric loss and orbital excitation inflation. They're amplified to such a degree that they are read readily observable. Uh, Dr. Day, uh, he plans to and performs synergistic observations using the best ground base and space-based facilities. And his research leverages the short, shortest period rocky planets as a laboratory to understand the formation and composition of rocky worlds. With that, I introduce our speaker and his title, Probing Planet Formation with the Most Extreme Cases. Take it away, Dr. Day. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for the introduction. And I couldn't give a better summary of my research myself. All right, uh, so the title of my talk today is Probing Planet Formation with the Most Extreme Cases. Well, in order to understand a process as complex as planet formation, the most extreme cases can often be the most revealing. So before we uh, dive into the extreme exoplanets, let's take a step back and look at the status of the exoplanet field in general. Almost three decades after the discovery of the first exoplanet, planet, today there are about 4,000 confirmed planets, thanks to a variety of different detection methods listed here. And the transits and radial velocity methods are by far the most prolific in terms of number of detections. Very briefly, the transit method looks for periodic dimmings of the host star that is caused by a transiting planet that blocks some of the starlight. On the other hand, the radial velocity method looks for a Doppler shift of the host star spectrum as a result of capillary motion of the planet. So the transit signal tells us about the radius of a planet, whereas uh, the radial velocity method tells us uh, the mass of a planet. The NASA Kepler mission was a major milestone that really advanced understanding of planet occurrence rate and orbital architecture. Kepler showed us closing sub-Neptune planets, planets smaller than Neptune, with semi-major axis less than one AU, are very common in our galaxy with every sun-like star having an order of unity probability of hosting one such planet. And the figure here shows a typical Kepler system, Kepler-186, which have five detected planets. And you can also notice how, how all five planets are all well within the orbit of Mercury compared to our solar system. Moreover, Kepler showed us small planet actually has a very curious bimodal radius distribution. And this is a crucial result. I'll come back later to I'll come back to later. In 2018, the test mission took over the baton of planet discovery. The test mission is now conducting a nearly full sky, sky survey so that it can review the nearest, brightest planet hosts. Compared to Kepler, the test planets are much closer to Earth at about 10 to 100 parsec range compared to the few hundred parsec range from Kepler. So these nearby systems, showing orange, are most amenable to detailed follow-up characterization with the James Webb Space Telescope. Generally speaking, the study of exoplanets is undergoing a paradigm shift 
from the early years of plant discovery to the population uh, study in the Kepler and Tess era, and now moving on to a time of detailed characterization. The detection of biosignatures on Earth's analogs will be the holy grail of our field. And with Luwa, Habex, and GMT TMT recommended by the NASA 2020 Decayo survey, such a discovery may be just a few decades ahead of us. Rocky planets in the habitable zone of M dwarfs will be the first batch we study with the best ground based telescope, such as ELT, TMT, and GMT. So the plot on the right shows the contrast in brightness between the host star and the planet as a function of the angular separation. So the red curves shows our best ground-based telescope capability. And we will use them to study uh, M, M dwarf planets, for example, Proxima Centauri B. Eventually, we will have to go to space to achieve that 10 to the minus 10 contrast ratio to detect a true Earth analog around the sun-like star. And this requires missions such as Luva and Habex. In other case, there's an urgent need to identify appropriate targets from transit surveys such as TESS, as well as ground-based radio velocity surveys. Equally important, there is also a need for us to revise our understanding of planet formation and evolution. What is the typical composition of a rocky planet? Can they retain the atmosphere over geological time scales? And how about the orbital stability? While many of my exoplanet colleagues are focusing on detecting the most Earth-like planets in a solar neighborhood, my research addresses the second need. I focus on the planet that perhaps least Earth-like, and we consider these planet extreme cases because they are heavily influenced by some key processes that we still don't fully understand. And we can use these planets as an opportunity to study these important processes that may be too weak or too slow to be observable on habitable zone planets. All right, that sets the stage of the talk. And let's investigate one archetypal uh, extreme planets, the ultra short carrier planets, or in acronym USPs. So the USPs can be loosely defined as Earth sized or super Earth planets with orbital period less than one day on Earth. And they are the hottest possible planets. Many of them are close to being tidally disrupted by the whole star. Earlier work found about 100 USPs among the 200,000 Kepler stars, indicating that their occurrence rate around sun-like stars is about half a percent. Also notable is that their radii almost never exceed two Earth radius, shown here in this histogram, putting this planet in the super-Earth or Earth-like regime. So the USPs are all expected to be tidally locked with the whole star. The surface temperature on the day side of the planet can easily exceed 1,000 or even 2,000 Kelvin, leading to at least partial melting of the surface. And the classic example of USP is Kepler 78, which orbits a sun-like star every eight hours. And its radius and mass are 1.2 and 1.9 that time of period. So if you ask me, one of the most exciting discoveries for exoplanet in recent years is that the radii of small planets actually has a bimodal distribution. And this has some profound implication on the planet evolution. So the prevailing interpretation is that the smaller peak at about 1.5 Earth radius are the so-called super Earths or exposed rocky cores that have their hydrogen and helium envelope completely stripped off by mass loss. And the higher peak, just above two Earth radius, are the planets that are massive enough or distant enough so that they hold on to the atmosphere. And these are uh, the planet known as mini Neptunes. And the radius gap, the prominent radius gap between them is carved out by vigorous mass loss. So people generally agree on this picture, but what they don't agree is what exactly drives this mass loss. One explanation is full evaporation by high energy radiation from the host star. Both extreme UV and X-ray photons can penetrate pretty deep into the atmosphere heat up the thermosphere, and leads, which leads to a bulk hydrodynamic outflow of the planet. And we have done some cutting edge hydrodynamic simulation to model this effect. We'll talk about this more later. Another school of thought for how planet loses mass is the so-called core power mass loss. 
Here, the residual heat from planet formation alone can drive a mass loss without the help of high energy radiation from the host star. So how do we know which is the dominant effect? There's actually a simple test. This is to examine the radius distribution across different stellar types. Photo evaporation, which is powered by high energy radiation from the host star, should see a strong dependence on stellar types, particularly towards M dwarfs, which have enhanced surface magnetic activity, higher flaring rate, as well as a longer pre-mean sequence lifetime during which the star is active. On the other hand, the core power mass loss should be the same as long as the bolometric insulation of planet receives is held constant. This is because the bolometric insulation sets the planet temperature, which in turn sets its cooling rate and mass loss rate. So to compare these two scenarios, we look at the radius distribution of planets around M dwarfs. In our earlier work, we showed pretty clearly that the radius gap just below two Earth radius is also present around M dwarfs, indicating that whatever process responsible for carving out the radius gap for sun-like stars must also operate for M dwarf planets. And the next question we ask, can we use the ultra short period planets, which are the hottest possible planet, to distinguish these two theories of planetary mass loss? After all, these hottest planets are the planets that have experienced the strongest mass loss. For that, we investigated the location of the so called hot Neptune desert. If you plot the radius of exoplanets versus uh, the bolometric insulation they receive, there's clearly a lack of planet between two and four Earth radius at the highest insulation or shortest orbital periods. And this is highlighted by this gray box here. And this is the so-called hot Neptune desert. And the idea is that Neptune-sized planet here experience a mass loss so strong that they quickly strip down to the bare rocky cores and become the USPs. For sun-like stars, this hot Neptune desert seems to occur at about 650 Earth's insulation or beyond, basically the gray box here. So how about for M dwarfs? In the lower two panels, we made similar plots using M dwarf planets splitting between the early M dwarfs and mid to late M dwarfs, where the cutoff is 3,500 Kelvin in T effective. Um, and we will produce the desert boundary for sun-like stars as this blue box here. Note I have also flipped the axis so that higher insulation is now on the left of the plot. So if core power mass loss is the dominant effect, we should see the hot Neptune desert basically occur at the same bolometric insulation. However, the data suggests otherwise. The M dwarfs seems to be more effective at reducing the size of the planet. The desert consistently occurs at a lower bolometric insulation compared to sun-like star. Here we drew some empirical boundary, boundary outlining the desert around M dwarfs. And for both cases, we can see the boundary is lower compared to sun-like stars. Moreover, for mid to late M dwarfs, which are known to have a fully convective nature uh, interior, they should, they should be the more active uh, version of the M dwarfs. And for them, we can see that the hot Neptune desert occurs at an even lower, um, uh, at an even lower insulation. So we believe this result is a telltale sign that photo evaporation rather than core power mass loss is the main driver for carving out the radius gap. Moving on to the composition of the shortest period planet. In the foreseeable future, the USPs are still a best chance of constraining the composition of Earth-sized planet. With a much closer orbit, a USP can induce a radial velocity signal that is the order of magnitude stronger than true Earth analog. For true Earth analog, the expected signal is about 10 centimeters per second whereas for USPs, they increase to one meter per second or even higher. And this will help put this planet within the reach of the current best special graphs. Moreover, the USPs are all, are all well within the hot Neptune desert. Their typical insulation is more than a thousand times that of the Earth. So this, for these planets, we know they have probably lost their hydrogen heating envelope. And this removes a lot of degeneracy in modeling the core composition of these planets. 
Also, for decades, the anomalously high 70% iron mass fraction of mercury was quite a mystery. Several explanations have been offered, including giant impact collision, disk temperature gradient, mental evaporation, and so on. I won't go into the details of these theories, but the bottom line is that the composition of the USPs served to directly falsify these theories. For some of them, they would predict that the USPs should be even more metal rich than mercury because of the much hotter and much shorter orbit. Earlier, I mentioned how the transit method could provide us a large number of transiting planets. And the next step, and usually the bottleneck, is to follow up the planets with precise radial velocity measurements to measure their mass. And this usually involves several nights' investment on the world's largest telescopes. I'm part of the two of the largest collaboration in our fields that have extensive access to the best ground-based telescope, such as La Silla Harps, Keck, and the Magellan Telescope in Chile. So our efforts together more than doubled the sample size of well-characterized US USPs over the past few years. Now let's take a look at the results. This is more or less a complete census of the USP planet characterized so far. We plotted their mass radius versus radical mass radius curves. For 100% water uh, in the blue line, 100% rock in the brown line, 100% iron in the gray line, as well as Earth-like 30% iron, 70% rock line. So although a few planets may favor a substantial iron mass fraction, a Mercury-like 70% iron mass fraction really does not seem to be the norm for these planets, which will put the planet closer to the 100% iron line. So this clearly contradicts with several Mercury formation scenarios. Although individual error bars on these points can be quite big, but as an ensemble, these extremely hot worlds have on average 32% plus minus 4% iron mass fraction. And this is remarkably similar to Earth. Our work seems to suggest there may be a preponderance of Earth-like composition, even among the rocky planets on such short orbital periods. Well, there's only so much we can do with just mass and radius measurements. If, you, if we look at our own solar system, the terrestrial planet, as well as Io and the moon, are all consistent with just iron rock mixtures. But we will have a very hard time telling their detailed composition apart in a mass radius diagram with the kind of uncertainty we have for exoplanets. However, as we can see within our solar system, there's a good variety of surface appearances for these rocky bodies. For example, space weathering on Moon and Mercury uh, causes the darkening of the surface. And ongoing volcanism on Io refreshes the surface and produces a yellowish tint from pyroclastic sulfur. And on Mars, the reddish hue probably came from a thin layer of surface iron oxide. So to fully explore the composition of the exoplanets, we need to look at the spectra. So I'm very proud to say our JWST program was accepted. Caltech student Michael Zhang, who I'm co-advising with Professor Knudsen, is leading this work. We are focusing on a particular ultra-shell period planet, GJ367, which is a sub-Earth with a 0.7 Earth radius on 0.3-day orbit around a nearby M dwarf with a J band magnitude of 6.6. .6. So according, the according to the best transit detection simulations, this planet is probably the most observationally favorable transiting planet in the entire solar neighborhood that will ever be discovered in this radius regime. So we will observe the brightness of the planet at different orbital phases, or otherwise known as its phase curve, with the MIRI instrument on board JWST. So earlier we mentioned these planets are tidally locked with the host star, so they have a constant day side and a night side. So if a planet is a bare rocky core, we should expect to see a large day-night temperature contrast, which is shown by the blue curve. Here, the phase curve has a larger amplitude, and the peak of the phase curve should be just the noon of the planet. On the other hand, if this planet somehow managed to keep a thick atmosphere, the atmosphere would act as a thermal blanket and transport heat from the day side to the night side of, of the planet. And the resultant phase curve, showing orange, we generally have lower amplitude and a prominent phase offset towards the afternoon side of the planet. 
Furthermore, with low resolution spectroscopy, we can begin to tell the dominant mineralogy on such a planet. For a planet that resembles modern Earth, we may expect to see the silicon to oxygen uh, stretching mode near nine micron, which is shown by the red line. On the other hand, if the planet is really mercury-like, having an iron-rich mineralogy, one might expect a stronger emission overall, but no prominent features shown by the blue line. So due to the relatively short lifetime of JWST mission, which is the estimated lifetime is about 10 years, uh, depending on how fast we use the cryogen on board. So there's an urgent need to rapidly provide a fresh sample of well-characterized planets before we sink 20 to 30 hours of precious JWS time on these planets. So recognizing the urgency and scientific opportunity here, NASA was willing to give us two nights on the upcoming Keck Planet Finder, which is next generation spectrograph for Keck. So I'm part of the KPF or Keck Planet Finder science team, and I'm the PI of this NASA large program. Starting in 2023, we will have two nights on Keck to observe the most observationally favorable USB planet and characterize them before future JWST observation. So to put things into perspective, if we are to buy time on the CAC telescope, which by the way is still the world's largest optical telescope, each night on CAC costs about $100,000. So looking ahead, the ultra-short period planets will remain an important laboratory for us to understand rocky planets. For example, we can look at the tidal deformation the current record holder for the shortest period for these planets is about four hours. So some believe such a planet is so strongly totally distorted that it probably has a football shape. And we also look forward to study the interior composition from a handful of ultra sharp cure planets. And these plants are currently being totally shredded by the whole star as shown by the artistic uh, impression here on the left. We know at least three uh, solid examples where this is happening, uh, this is where this tidal disruption is actively happening. And if the USB plants are indeed lava worlds, they will be a proxy for the Hadean or early Archean Earth, which also has a molten surface. So we can use these plants as time machines to study important processes that happen on early Earth, such as outgassing, lava flow, and early volcanism on these plants. So our JWST program for the phase curve analysis is just the beginning. Once the data comes down and we understand the systematics and the capability of JWST better, we are eager to put these ide further ideas to JWST characterization. All right, that concludes the first part of my talk on the hottest possible planet. Now let's take a look at, at another extreme of planet formation, the superpaths or the planets with the, sh with the lowest densities. So our paper on the superpass actually made the front cover of the National Astronomical Society website because we offered a first viable solution to these very puzzling planets that have perplexed the community for years. So what exactly is a superpass? Well, a superpass is a planet with super Earth-like mass, usually less than five Earth mass, but the radius of a gas giant, usually larger than five Earth radius. So if you plot these superpaths on mass radius diagram with other known exoplanets, they are clearly outliers. Their mean density sits between 0.1 and 0.01 gram per centimeter cubed. This is one or even two orders of magnitude compared to other exoplanets. To put things into perspective, such a density is very similar to the density of a cotton candy. Some prime examples of superpaths are Kepler-51, which we will talk about, Kepler 79, 87, and 1.7. So we know probably this is not a statistical fluke. They are indeed a sample of plant that have such low density. Okay, the low density alone doesn't explain why superpaths have been so puzzling to many theorists. The main concern here is that the extended atmosphere on the superpaths is bound to undergo very rapid mass loss. If you plug them in into a simple Parker wing model, the atmosphere would dissipate very quickly on a time scale of a thousand years or even less. 
This is much shorter than the system age, which is typically millions, if not giga years old. A theorist like Owen Wu admitted quite frankly in their paper that they were literally scratching in their heads about the very existence of the superpowers. Before we discuss superpowers in detail, let me briefly describe the idea of transmission spectroscopy. If we exam examine the spectrum of a whole star during a planetary transit, the starlight will be absorbed and scattered uh, by the planetary atmosphere. And the resultant spectral features that we see will enable us to study the properties as well as composition of the atmosphere. As a rule of thumb, atmospheres with larger scale height generally will produce a larger uh, transmission signal. So coming back to the superpaths, perhaps even more puzzling for these planets is that their extended atmosphere also translates to very large scale height. For Kepler-51, the scale height is estimated to be about 3,000 kilometers compared to 10 kilometers we have on Earth and 30 kilometers we have on Jupiter. Again, the transmission signal should scale directly with the scale height, and this will make SuperPuff ideal targets for transmission spectroscopy. However, recent Hubble observations show that both planets in the Kepler-51 system have a completely flat transmission in the near infrared, as shown here. One has to form a cloud layer to about 0.1 millibar level um, to effectively mute absorption feature. By the way, a cloud layer is a source of gray opacity since uh, it is mostly me scattering. It doesn't have much spectral de dependence. However, if we look at the pressure temperature diagram for the Kepler-51 planet, shown here by the color solar line, and the condensation curves of all relatively abundant cloud-forming species, shown by the uh, dashed line. The intersection between these two types of lines, the solar line and dashed line, are where clouds should form in traditional cloud formation models. And this usually happens at about one bar level, one bar pressure level. And this is much deeper than the 0.1 millibar level required to flatten the transmission spectroscopy. So these data were taken back in 2015. However, it was only published last year. For quite a number of years, no one knew how to make sense of these uh, results. So previous works have all focused on a hydrostatic model for atmospheres. If we were willing to embrace a non-static hydrodynamic atmosphere, the solution is suddenly obvious. In our 2019 work, we consider atmosphere that is undergoing moderate outflow at about 0.1 Earth's mass per giga year. Such outflow is slow enough to be consistent with the system's age of about 300 million years. In other words, it doesn't cause a catastrophic loss of hydrogen heat envelope. But on the other hand, such outflow is fast enough that it can carry with it small dust particles to high altitudes. So you increase a great opacity at high altitudes due to the dust inflate the transit radius of planet, which is shown on the right. Simultaneously, these stars particles also helps to mute any absorption features. This is shown on the left. And in our dusty outflow model, we, can, we have no problem reproducing the flat transmission curve that we see from Hubble. As for the source of the dust particles, it can either come from photochemistry of the planet itself or from the accretion and the breaking up of planetesimals that may be still infalling onto these young planets. So this idea of dusty outflow may not be as crazy as it initially sounds because mass loss from small planets seems to be very common if not ubiquitous phenomenon. This is again supported by the pronounced radius gap that we see. Within the photo evaporation picture we just talked about, the host star is very active in X-ray and extreme UV during the first few hundred million years of its lifetime. And Kepler-51 be being uh, just 300 million years, it's right, uh, it's right in that regime of actively losing its mass. So to test this dusty outflow idea further, we would again need JWST observation. At about three micron, we expect to see a prominent feature due to the carbon to hydrogen bond 
if the haze particle is dominated by hydrocarbons. However, if you are not, if you are just as impatient as we are, there's another way to test the outflowing model. This is to directly observe ongoing planetary mass loss. So here, let me shift our focus from Kepler 51 towards 107, which is a much more observationally favorable exoplanet. So this planet is on a six day orbit around the K star. Its radius is very similar to Jupiter radius, but it only has 10% of Jupiter's mass. And the mean density turns out to be about 0.2 gram per centimeter cubed. And this system is again pretty young at about 600 million years old. And the transmission spectrum uh, is again muted by high altitude opacity sources. So to observe the atmospheric erosion in action, we look at a metastable helium transition. Well, for those of us who do not think about atmospheric, uh, atomic physics every day, here's a brief reminder. Neutral helium can be in the also a parallel state, depending on whether it's two electrons are parallel or anti-parallel. And respectively, for the singular states, the 1-1-S state is a ground state. And for the triple state, the 2-3-S state is the ground state. And these two states are radiatively decoupled uh, due to the selection rule uh, in the LS coupling regime, which is shown here. Uh, yeah, I should mention that uh, once uh, a helium atom um, recombine after photoionization, it can either end up in the singlet or triplet state. If the atom end up in the triplet state, it will be metastable because uh, the radiative decay time scale is relatively long, at least a few hours. So if we examine uh, exoplanet outflow, some of that helium will be in this triplet state. And uh, from the triplet state, uh, the atom can absorb uh, light in the infrared, well, near the 10830 10, Anstrom range from that 23 S state to that 23 P state, shown by the, uh, the red uh, arrows here. So this transition has been a workhorse for studying planetary mass loss thanks to the high cosmic abundance, as well as long lifetime of the metastable helium transition. And moreover, I mentioned this is an infrared transition and is observable from the ground. So we can invest large telescope time to, these, uh, to, observe, uh, to observe these outflow events. All right, people have been using this metastable helium transition to gauge how fast a planet is losing its atmosphere. However, people usually just use a very simple energy limited prescription in which the mass loss rate is proportional to the high energy radiation the planet intercepts divided by the gravitational potential of the planet, shown by this equation here. And all our lack of knowledge of how this process happened in detail is captured in that efficiency parameter eta. Or slightly better, people have tried to use a simple 1D isothermal Parker ring model to fit the observations. Needless to say, these simple models are very ad hoc and they fail to capture the full dynamics and chemistry of the planetary outflow. So we developed, we developed the very first self-consistent 3D hydrodynamic simulation with ray tracing and non-equivalent chemistry. In contrast to previous models, we can predict from first principle rather than assume the mass loss rate the temperature profile, the ionization state, and the 3D kinematics of the outflow. So I, I won't have time to go into the details of our simulation. It's probably worthy of another talk. I'll we'll just show our simulation for what's 107 here. Here, the planet is located in the center of the simulation domain. And we are looking down the north pole of the planet. And the whole star is located to the left of the plot. And the planet's orbital motion is upwards uh, in the plane of the, uh, of the screen. And the different panel shows respectively the overall density, the line of side velocity, the number density in metal stable here, as well as the temperature outflow of the outflow. And let me run the simulation. Here we can see the high energy radiation from the whole star has no problem generating a photo evaporation from the planet. And moreover, we seem to see 
signs of Kelvin Helmholtz instability developing uh, at the very outer boundary of the outflow. So by sampling the parameter space, we found that the outflow can adopt very different morphologies depending on the amount of high energy radiation we put in, as well as the amount, uh, as well as the strength of stellar wind from the whole star. And our best fit model reproduces the metastable helium observation very well, both in terms of the line profile, uh, showing the upper right panel, which is simply the amount of absorption at different wavelengths, as well as the line uh, life curve, which is simply the absorption as a function of time in the lower panel. The different symbols here, blue and red, are from two different telescopes for one small 7D. And our black solid line is the best fit model. And we can see that our model fits the various observations pretty well. According to our model, one small 7D is undergoing rather vigorous mass loss at a rate of about one Earth mass per year. And a key prediction in our, in our model is that stellar wind from the whole star, as well as non-inertial forces, collimates the outflow into a comet-like tail that's lagging behind the planet, as shown on the left. So after the publication of our work, a new helium line observation was published. And this new helium line observation, uh, shown here on the right panel by the black points, this new observation crucially covered the post egress part of the transit, during which the comet like tail should still provide additional absorption after the nominal transit ends. So, this schematic on top shows appearances of the system from the observer's perspective. And we can see in the very last panel, T4, here the panel itself has left the disk of the whole star but the tail of the outflow still lags behind it and produces additional absorption in metastable helium. Remind you, the model was fitted to the red points only, but it showed remarkable, re remarkable agreement with the new post egress observation showing black. So this remarkable agreement between our simulation and the observation gave us a lot of confidence in our model. We then used it to study the microphysics of planetary mass loss. I don't have time to go into details, but some of the key findings are listed here. Very briefly, we investigated the necessity of having 3D simulation, and we, we investigated what energy band, whether it's X-ray or EUV, that's most important for driving the mass loss. And we also investigated how the outflow responds to stellar flaring events, uh, things like that. If you're curious about that, we can talk more about this after the talk. So our work has shown that the superpaths can be explained if they are young planets that are actively losing a dirty atmosphere. And we can use these planets to study planetary mass laws in general. Here, I would like to highlight a future project linking back to the habitability of a planet. So the tra traditional wisdom is that Earth either did not accrete a hydrogen helium envelope to begin with, or have lost most of that hydrogen helium due to early genes escape, which has a strong molecular mass dependence. Subsequently, secondary atmosphere developed from outgassing or volatile delivery. And this evolutionary pathway is shown on the right. By the way, in genes escape, lighter atoms typically have a higher thermal velocity and they can be preferentially lost from the thermosphere, uh, from the exosphere without undergoing another collision. However, a recent work by Kite and Badanet raised a very interesting possibility. If a planet has a primordial hydrogen helium envelope, that hydrogen helium envelope may be actually detrimental to the formation of a secondary atmosphere. And the idea is that with hydrogen helium, follow evaporation is the dominant mode of mass loss. And to remind you, follow evaporation is a hydrodynamic mass loss. So different molecules in the atmosphere are lost together and leaving behind the planet a bare, a bare rocky core. And this is particularly relevant for the habitability of M dwarf planets, since their host stars are more active and emit a larger fraction of their light in X-ray and UV. So this early result by Kat and Burnett was based on the simple energy-limited mass loss prescription we just described. 
We very much look forward to testing this novel idea with our self-consistent hydrodynamic mass, mass loss model. And the intendability of the atmosphere, particularly the secondary ones, have far-reaching implication on the habitability. Okay, that brings me to the final part of my talk, which uh, is about peculiar plants on oblique orbits. Well, the stellar obliquity is a quanti key quantity that we will discuss uh, in this section. The stellar obliquity is simply the angle between the orbital axis of the planet and the rotation axis of its whole star. If we look at our own solar system, the planets are all well aligned with the, with the sun's rotation axis. The stellar obliquity are generally smaller than a few degrees, with the largest being for Mercury at about 70. So this coplanar architecture is consistent with the idea that our solar system probably formed from a disk. However, many exoplanets are perpendicular, even retrograde orbits around their host star. And this high stellar obliquity is usually linked to a dynamical upheaval a system has gone through. Many theorists maintain that many uh, these misaligned planets probably form initially coplanar with a disk. But after this dissipates, dynamic interaction with other planets or co-moving binar binaries in the system, same system generates that large tilted orbit. So to measure the stellar ability, we usually perform a delicate uh, special scopic measurement during a planetary transit. Let's look at the schematic on the left. From the observer's point of view, since this whole star is rotating, half of the star is blue shifted and the other half blue shifted with respect to the observer. Now a transiting planet comes along, it will sequentially block the blue shifted and the red shifted part of the star and break the balance between the two. And if we measure the radial velocity of the whole star, we will see a peculiar pattern due to the planet. And this is known as the roster McLaughlin effect. And from modeling the shape of the roster McLaughlin effect, we can deduce the orbital orientation of the planet. Shown on the right are a case of well-aligned orbits, as well as a case for misaligned orbit. And here can, you can see the shape of the RM effect differs. So let's continue our story on WASP-107. The planet also turns out to be dynamically interesting. With our 10 meter tag telescope, we measured the very delicate RM effect for WASP-107, which is shown on the left. And the pattern is curiously indicative of a nearly polar orbit for the planet. And the result was pre presented by my student, Ryan Rubenzel, who I'm co-advising with Professor Howard. So let's recall what we know about what's small seven so far. Earlier I mentioned that the planet has a really low mean density of 0.2 gram per centimeter cubed and the particular puffy atmosphere. The planet is actively losing mass as we have seen in metastable helium observation at about one Earth's mass per giga year rate, according to our hydrodynamic simulation. The planet also has a Jupiter mass companion on 1100 day orbit, which is not transiting. Now the polar orbit of the inner planet on six day orbit might provide the final missing link for a complete story of the system. And we advocate for the following evolution pathway for WAS-17. The planet probably formed initially further out in the disk likely beyond the snow line, where temperature is cooler and the panel was able to create a substantial atmosphere. After the disk dissipated, dynamic interaction with that 1100-day planet launched the inner planet into an eccentric inclined orbit around the host star. And if the eccentricity is large enough, tidal interaction with the host star shrink the orbit of the inner planet. Eventually, the planet circularizes but the high eccentricity, high inclination persists. This is because orbital inclination has to be damped out by the tides raised on the star, whereas eccentricity is damped out by the, by the planet itself, usually ha which usually has a much smaller tidal quality factor. So the huge amount of heat released in this tidal migration resulted in the rapid mass loss that we observed in metastable stable helium. And the high obliquity today we measure is a fossil record of all these dynamically hot evolution pathway. So we believe WAS-17 is the very first system 
for which the dynamic and hot migration formation, um, a migration evolution scenario explains various existing observations very consistently. All right, for future work, marine stellar obliquity is another area where the Keck Planet Finder will shine. The Keck Planet Finder's unique combination of high efficiency, high stability, as well as that 10 meter aperture means that it is about 10 times faster than the current generation spectrograph, such as Newt and Harps. And with that, we'll push the limits of stellar obliquity measurements to fainter but scientifically more interesting planets, especially those around M especially those around uh, young planetary systems. And we know certain dynamical process was probably responsible for generating plants on tilted orbits. However, no consensus has been achieved with regards to which mechanism is the dominant one. Fortunately, many of the proposed mechanisms for tilting planetary orbit operate on very different time scale as shown on the right plot. For example, the famous COSI leadoff mechanism operates over tens of kilo years, or 100 million years, depending on the system configuration. Whereas the secular interaction, particularly the secular chaos idea uh, happens on hundreds of, hundreds of million years time scale. So stellar obliquity measurement for young stars with well-known ages, particularly those in young clusters, will help us identify the dominant dynamical process at play. So I'm leading the stellar obliquity measurements for the Keck Planet Finder, and we have a pending large proposal from NSF to fund us for 20 to 30 obliquity measurements in, in the next three years. And we will slowly fill up the upper left corner of this obliquity versus H parameter space. All right, let me conclude by putting my research into the broader context of the exoplanet field. As I mentioned, uh, the detection of biosignatures on Earth's analogs will be the ultimate goal of our field. And I see my research on the extreme planets as paving the way to this long-term goal. The ultra-shell pure planets provide us a preamble into the composition, mineralogy, and the formation pathway of rocky planets, which are very difficult to study for true Earth analogs. And the superpaths and the study of planetary mass loss in general will help us understand the retainability of hydrogen helium envelope as well as secondary envelopes. And the same processes of mass loss may operate on habitable planets, particularly those around M dwarfs. Finally, understanding planet on oblique orbits reveals the dynamical history of the system. And we know from our own solar system, the Nice model and the Grand Tech model have far reaching influence on the architecture of our own solar system. So how about for exoplanetary systems? Just imagine what would happen to a habitable zone planet if its Jupiter-sized companion moved all the way from a few AU to one AU or even shorter. Will the habitable planet survive this process? And how often does this kind of dynamical upheaval happen? Uh, I think all these questions have important implications on planetary uh, habitability, and I hope to address these questions in the coming years. All right, that's all I want to say, and uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you. That was a great talk, Dr. Day. It's really neat to see um, how you use those extreme planets to teach us about our own solar system and how um, we can learn and test about the dynamic evolution models that we have in place to explain where Jupiter might have formed and where it might have gone. Uh, I see our first question we have is from Lee Sabatka. Go ahead, Lee. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so uh, uh, concerning the uh, uh, metastable helium, the triplet helium um, uh, dynamics, uh, both in orthopositronium and, uh, and uh, molecular excited triplets, um, there are many ways to, to pick off uh, this, uh, this spin triplet. And one, and so you had uh, uh, an infrared uh, photon exciting it uh, to another state, which then could uh, fluoresce to the ground state. But um, uh, the mechanism, hold on a second. The, the, me the mechanism that is often run into is 
Uh, so I'm wondering if you would consider a triplet triplet annihilation. Mm -hmm. So if the density of triplets is high enough, you get T plus T going to S1 plus S0. And you did not mention that. Yeah. So let me first of all clarify, we are not looking for fluorescence. We are looking for absorption, meaning that some of that heat and particles after recombination will be in the triplet state. And the whole star is, imagine that's a giant lab shining behind the planet. A giant lab has some photons uh, near that 1080 transition. And the signal we are looking at is the absorption due to that matter stable two, P, two, three, two, three S states. Um, right, but it, the life, but uh, isn't the concentration of that, if the concentration of that density is high enough, it self annihilates. Exactly. So this is why we perform that 3D self consistent model rather than trusting like a 1D isothermal model. Because uh, in our 3D model, self consistent model, we incorporate both the photo chemistry or the photo ionization recombination as well as the collisional effects. So you, you know? have you have TTA, exactly. what's called TTA in your model. Well, in astronomy jargons, we probably didn't call that, but we do have two body collisional process that depopulates this state. Okay, I mean, you have T, T plus T. You have triplet plus triplet. You have a, you uh, have a quadratic term in the... Yeah, we do have quadratic terms. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, um, we do have a question in the chat from Hendrik. Hendrik asks, do you see opportunities for collaboration with our current cosmochemistry group, which studies extraterrestrial materials and the implications for solar system formation? Yeah. I know the short answer is yes. <laughs> so I'll talk about a possible collaboration tomorrow. Well, some of the projects I'm thinking about, I think will be of broader interest to the department. Today, I thought this talk was mostly showcasing my own work or past work. Um, so I'll save that for tomorrow. Okay, I see Katrina has a question. Go ahead, Katrina. Hello again, and thank you for your very nice talk. I have a question about the planetary mass loss uh, scenario that you showed for the uh, puffy planets. Mm -hmm. And what I was wondering about that in your simulation, I was not entirely clear. You showed the polar projection of the outflow or in, in, in the one diagram in your talk. And I was, yeah. I was actually wondering if that mass loss is spherical, as you would expect if the dust is uniformly distributed through the outer atmosphere or if it's a polar flow that might also be influenced by the magnetic field of the whole star. It, I was not completely clear on, mm -hmm. on, on that. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, let me bring on my slides again. Let's see. Share the screen first. So, First of all, our model is still a hydrodynamic model. We haven't incorporated the effect magnetic field or MHD effect. So all of, all of the simulations here we see uh, do not consider a planetary uh, magnetic field. So even so, the outflow is far from isotropic. We can see that all the day side outflows are actually diverted towards the night side. Uh, the, different right lines are streamlines in your simulation. Mm. And the idea is that the stellar wind from this young star collimates the outflow towards the night side. And okay. Yeah. So, uh, the, so there is no magnetic effects like ionosphere interaction with, with the whole star or stuff mm. like that in, in, in involved yet? Yeah, because that's something we hope to do in the future. And so, first of all, let me make a justification here. So these planets are known, well, I expect it to be tidally locked with the whole star. So with the orbital period of six days, the rotation period is probably also six days. 
And if we naively take the dynamo scaling relations, uh, the magnetic field on these planets probably uh, quite weaker compared to uh, say Jupiter or Saturn, which have typically 10 hour rotation. Uh, the other difficulty here is that if we consider mass loss from Earth, Mars, Jupiter, we are safely outside the alphanic radius. But for some of these planets, the orbital period is so short, six day. Uh, you can imagine that, we can imagine that some of these planets may still be within that alphanic radius of these young stars. And there, the complex interplay between the stellar magnetic field and planet's magnetic field so, uh, seems complicated. And uh, we didn't want to touch on that in this first. Okay. Yeah. So the so the nice uh, aurora borealis that I see in your background there is not something that I can expect to see on these exoplanets like we see them on Jupiter and I think Saturn has they they have been discovered too. Not that they are outflows, but just bringing the three things together. Uh, your background, the exoplanets, and Jupiter and Saturn. Uh yeah, so I actually had a slide on that. People argue for, especially for the ultra short pure planet, which might be a source of ions. And we may see a star planet magnetic interaction very similar to Io Jupiter system. So I spent some time looking for signals like that, but didn't have much luck. And it's definitely something very interesting, and uh, it could well be happening, but with the current signal noise or the current technology we have, we may not be able to see it. But in the future, I can imagine that being like a major direction um, where our research on the closing planets uh, may go. Okay, thank you. Sure. See, Ryan has his hand up. Go ahead, Ryan. Uh, thank you, Faye. This was great. Um, the, the number of tools that you bring to bear on these problems is, is very cool, very impressive. Um, I have a few questions I'm, I'm trying to remember. Um, oh, your cloud, the species in your clouds I thought were unus unusual. I, I saw some strange sulfides, zinc sulfide, and I was just wondering how you, um, where those came from. So this model Okay, let me explain how this model came about. Um, so this model was mainly authored by uh, uh, Dr. Wang, who's my close collaborators. He was writing this model with the idea of uh, modeling photo evaporation of protoplanted disks. So when I visited uh, Princeton back in 2017, he, he was spending years working on this model. Uh, but after talking with him, we quickly realized the same model after some modification can be applied to planetary mass loss. So much of the chemistry is inherited from what's uh, appropriate for protoplanetary disk. Uh, you mentioned may, may I quickly say something? Sure. These, cl these cloud constituents go back to myself and Shannon Wischer and Bruce Fagley. So if you complain about the species, come to us. Oh, okay, sounds great. I'm the one complaining, so that's, that's okay. I, I got, I was, nobody else, I had a, another one about your, these cool, highly oblique planetary orbits. Um, so our Oort cloud is thought to be spherical in shape um, of interactions with nearby stars. So any kind of um, gravitational interactions could cause this, or is that not likely? Uh, sorry, I missed the first part of your question. Which plants were talking um, about? Oh, the, the, the third part of your talk about the highly oblique orbits. It, exactly, is... exactly. Uh, so tomorrow I'll briefly outline a, a current project we are doing. And we show pretty clearly that co-moving binaries uh, are actually the culprit, the main culprit for tilting at least some of these planets. And the, bi uh, the binary's gone, the companion's gone, or? So, uh, well, I, I wouldn't steal my punchline for tomorrow. Oh, but sorry. The, okay. idea <laughs> sorry. the idea is that we can, with Gaia's astrometric data, we can look at the relative, relative mutual inclination between the inner planetary system and its moving binary. And we know from several uh, dynamical interactions that mutual inclination is crucial to kickstart instability. And 
what we found uh, uh, from Gaia data is that for planets that are misaligned with respect to the whole star, they are also misaligned with respect to the Komuni binary, which seems to indicate that the binaries played a major role in killing the planets. Great. Um, I had one more small one, if, if I have time. The, um, the tail, the comet-like tail on your exoplanet, um, so are those ions and are they expected to follow the Parker spiral equivalent? Sorry, I missed, again, missed the first part. Um, your, your planet with the comet-like tail? Yeah. Uh, you said it was on, um, it was trailing the planet in orbit, right? So are, the, are these ions, these neutrals? Uh, let's see. So depending on the ionization time scale, depending on how much uh, XUV flux we put in. So I think the time scale is comparable. Um, so the outflow speeds, we have here is on the order of 10 kilometers per second. So crossing the radius of planet is a few hours. And the amount of high energy radiation we put in, uh, if I remember them were correct, the typical time scale for fully ionized uh, neutral hydrogen is also about a few hours. So uh, I don't have a plot here, but in general, our in our outflow, the, the outflow are slowly being fully ionized by the high energy radiation from the host star. So, so you'd expect that tail to, to follow the inner exoplanetary magnetic field, right? Is that true? Yeah, so after, so that's another shortcoming of our current model, but most of the helium absorption actually happened pretty, stood pretty deep in the heliosphere. So the detailed morphology out there where full ionization is, uh, has gone to completion. Uh, it's not currently fully described in our model, but we expect that not to play a significant role in the helium supergroups, which are much deeper. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, the, Ryan, you raised a very important point. I actually wanted to mention that, that is um, in the future, we look forward to for jointly modeling the helium transition as well as Lyman alpha transitions. So these two observations, observables actually probe very different uh, altitudes or different part of the outflow and may, uh, in principle, tell us more detail about how this outflow is happening. And it seems like we already have some incredible collaborations between Ryan, Katrina, and Vey. <laughs> we can reinvestigate these uh, exosphere uh, atmospheres or exoplanet atmospheres. Sounds great. Do we have any other questions? Um, I had one question. When you were looking at uh, using the, the USPs to understand the formation models of, of Mercury, um, you seem to imply that it was a, a high metal, like metal surface planet, whereas, you know, the, the surface is, is pretty low in, in iron. Um, yeah. Its interior is higher in iron. You know, how yeah. do you compare the, the kind of the surface composition versus an interior composition? I guess, what are the observables when you're so doing this? For our face curve observable, this is definitely probing in the surface only. And mm -hmm. uh, I know it's definitely quite a stretch to have a planet surface covered by iron-rich min minerals. Uh, but this is probably the best we can do with GWS observation. Um, so I mentioned that this planet GJ367 is the best uh, observable planet in the entire solar neighborhood. So by best, I mean, it is best today and in the distant future because our transit survey is rather complete. So even in the distant future, we'll probably not find an even better planet. So, the idea is that with Jerry's time, it's precious, but this is, okay, this is the best plan we can do this for. Why not just try it? Um, but we do have hopes for in, uh, probing the interior composition, as I mentioned. So there are at least three examples where the USPs is actually being totally shredded by the whole star. 
And we see that from asymmetric transit shape, again, very similar to the metastable helium light curve, but here it's in optical. And we think what is happening is either volcanoes or some other um, uh, events bring some of the, uh, well, heating from the USBs, bring some of the interior, interior, comp interior materials uh, out of the planet. And that interior uh, materials leave the planet heliosphere and again become like a tidal like ta uh, comet like tail. And with future JWSD, we can study those tails in detail and look for absorption features, or very simply the relay scattering slope to see the size of particles, things like that. Um, yeah, so we are hopeful in future cycles, um, we will get a better idea of the interior composition. Good, that answered one of my other questions was, how do you see that these planets are being tidally disrupted are they within the Roche limit or just near it? Yeah. it... So for rocky planets, uh, the Roche slope is uni only dependent on mean density of the planet. And from making reasonable assumption about the mean density, we can estimate uh, uh, the Roche slope radius. And those three totally disrupting planets are quite close to the Roche slope, uh, not, although not exactly within it. The other point I want to make is earlier today I talked with Ryan uh, is that if these planets can maintain a non-zero eccentricity, very much like what we see on Io from mean motion resonance interaction with other planets in the same system, that non-zero eccentricity is going to lead to a huge amount of heat dissipating in the planet and leads to strong volcanic activity very similar to Io. And those will be another source of uh, uh, the dust tails that we see. Well, thank you. Sure. Um, any last questions before we release our speaker for the day? I have one quick one in the, the related to your expertise, Jeff. Like if you had um, a planet this close to a star with a nice silicate mantle, would space weathering totally erase any kind of fe spectral features? This would be an extreme, <laughs> extreme space weathered thing. So even if it's full of olivine, would we see it? Yeah, probably not. It would just be glass at that point. Um, you know, iron and glass would give you some features, but but still, you know, if there wasn't enough iron, you would you would see nothing. It would just darken away, kind of similar to Mercury, but you know, that's a low iron surface planet. Yeah, that, that sounds like a very interesting project, uh, Jeff. Uh, yeah, we should definitely talk more about that. We'll talk with you tomorrow about it. That sounds great. All right, one last uh, round of thank yous for your wonderful talk today. I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure all in attendance did too. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right, take care and have a great evening.